everyone. I am Candace Williams, ABC News, and I have the distinct pleasure of moderating the panel for this upcoming star series, which is coming to us in mid-April, Confronting a Serial Killer. The series, executive produced and directed by Emmy-winning filmmaker Joel Berlinger, tells the story of how one author and journalist, Jillian Lauren, uncovered the secrets of the most prolific serial killer in American history, Sam Little, who brutally murdered 93 women and invaded law enforcement for four decades. Today, I am joined by director Joe Berlinger, hey. showrunner Paul Cutchins, another Emmy Award winning filmmaker, and New York Times bestselling author Jillian Lauren. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for doing this, Candace. Absolutely. Well, I want to start off by saying this is such an important conversation and series. So, Jillian, if it's okay, I'd love to start with you because as we've seen the first two episodes, you've had a real connection, a special connection to the story and project, partly because of your own experience. And I want you to talk a little bit about the process and the connection to those marginalized communities that Sam targeted? Uh, for me, when I first heard about this story, um, that was exactly what, what struck me. I said, um, you know, I have had this experience as, as a survivor of domestic violence, attempted murder, um, I said, you know, I can I can speak to this, and in fact, I think a lot of people would prefer to turn away. Um, and I think it's important, and I'm able. I can talk this language and say, you know, I, I had this experience that your mother had. I know she was a person. We can start from there. And so. Um, you know, I, you know, it was the passion project and it was, you know, I was a fascination. Yeah. Yeah. And we really see that. We really see your journey in this. And Joe and Poe as filmmakers, I imagine jumping into the series was no easy feat. So Joe, let's start with you. Talk about your approach as a director and handling this delicate story. Now, you know, Clearly, social justice space, you know this, you've, you've dabbled in this before, but how was this particular project different, and how did you earn the trust of those that you featured? A oh, great question. First of all, I just want to thank South by Southwest. This is, uh, I can't remember how many films I've had at, at South by, which is always a wonderful experience. This is the first time I've had a television series at South by, so this is, this is fun, and we appreciate their support. Um, you know, I've done quite a bit of, of crime over the years, but, and, and generally speaking, a lot of the crime I've done has been in the wrongful conviction space. Um, and this story just really grabbed my attention because if there was ever somebody worthy of conviction, it was this guy who, you know, in your intro, you said he evaded justice, which is true, but it's, it's more that there was neglect. Uh, I've never seen a situation where somebody was in the hands of law enforcement so many times and there were so many opportunities to bring this guy to justice and uh, the baked in racism and baked in uh, bias against marginalized communities just didn't light a fire under under the asses, if I may say, of certain people in law enforcement to bring this guy to justice. And it took a bunch of powerful women, you know, Detective Mitzi Roberts, the DA Beth Silverman, and Jillian Lauren. Uh, that's what that's what really attracted me to the, wanting to tell this story because it's it's a window into systemic problems in the justice system. So, in terms of uh, getting the trust of people, I think you know both Poe and I have really good track records. So, when we told people what we wanted to do. Um, our, our desire to make a very victim-focused show that peeled back the layers of 
serious problems in our criminal justice system. People responded to that. Um, my first, you know, the re whole reason I got into the show, uh, you know, Jillian wrote an article in New York Magazine about which, which was going to be uh, a chapter of her future book, which is now being written. Uh, and I just was compelled by how is it that somebody like Jillian was able to get this guy who denied his crimes for decades? How is it that she was able to make him feel comfortable to start revealing secrets? I thought that was an incredibly interesting thing. And the story itself, you know, again, is just such a window into, into problems that need fixing and to, you know, a lot of true crime gets, gets criticized for, uh, not being victim focused. Why are you giving a platform to a serial killer? Why are we celebrating the serial killer? And of course, we are giving voice to this serial killer because people need to understand the horrific nature of this kind of a person. And because the fact that he got away with it for so long and there was such indifference towards bringing him to justice when you have a monster of this magnitude is just mind-boggling so we are giving voice to a killer but most importantly most of the show is about you know generally strong women trying to bring this guy down and po that's a big part of where you come in and having these important people family members previous victims come in and be able to be open and be able to have these conversations that are very important Talk about some of the challenges in that and how you were able to get them to open up in such a way. Because one of the things that continued to sh just shock me and, and make me feel a certain way was the idea that these people were still dealing with this trauma and they were open about it. That's exactly it. Um, one of the victim's brothers, uh, Bob, uh, Bob LaPree, says it, we are all living victims of Sam Little. And we had to treat them as such. The, the residual effect of this kind of crime, the, the, the victims themselves often having had trauma that precipitated their becoming, being in the scenario that they could run into Sam Little. And then the families around them and how they were impacted by this violence and continue to be. And that happens when you cover your eyes to this kind of a crime. And they felt a stigma and they felt this ongoing trauma. And having to really respect that they are that they aren't just that you you don't want to just helicopter in and say, okay, tell us your story, and that's gonna fit neatly into this box. Each and every one of them has this incredibly impacted story to tell and 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 we want to and and are lucky enough often to hear back from them where they say you know this was cathartic for me i felt i was hiding this all along um uh you know when pearl nelson later on who was one of the um the daughter of one of the victims in la that he finally did get locked up to uh for she talks about how you know, she could never bring it up to other people. She was carrying this shame that they're made to feel and some of them being victimized by law enforcement because um, they wouldn't take up the cause and mistreated the memory of their um, loved one who had perished and also the survivors, the actual survivors of Sam and how they had lived with this all along. I mean, each and every one of them, you know, is a huge challenge. And you have to start at, at, at the very first step and show them that you have the empathy. I mean, they're incredibly distrustful and they should be. And we have an enormous responsibility um, to give them this platform, to tell their story, to make sure that it's um, told in a way that both shines light on what happened, also allows that victim to be a whole person again, because he, he, he erased that person, you know, and they're still holding them and they want the rest of the world to remember them not as a victim, but as that full whole human being with possibilities that he took away from them. And, you know, I feel like I, I hold it in my hand and I'm still in touch with, and we all are, and we hear from the people that we interviewed and they're so important. So they get added to that list, particularly the women survivors of 
Sam Little, that list of powerful women that like overcame this thing. I, I can't imagine, you know, the fortitude and, and, and the bravery that they have. Yeah. I mean, uh, that was just such a compelling part of this series is hearing their narratives, hearing what they went through. And Jillian, I, I want to touch on something that you actually say in the series and you sort of explain this idea of being, and I, and I'm going to quote it because it's, it's that important, less dead and more dead. And I want you to elaborate on what those ideas are and, and, Basically, you know, it kept coming back to me, which you guys have both all have mentioned, is that how was he able to get away with this for so long? And then it kind of comes back to this idea of, well, there's certain people that initially you start to think are important and we should hear them. And then there are other people less dead that become these people that you just forget about. You don't look for. You don't want to hear their testimony. So talk about that concept, and because that that threat continues on, and I think it's very important for you to talk about why. Um, I, yeah, thank you for that question, and I want to um, say, you know, what Joe said when he looked at this. I mean, when you look at Sam's rap sheet, and when you look at the violence. I mean, it's not that he was only arrested every other day for petty theft because he was, um, you know, but assault, rape, murder, kidnapping, um, attempted murder. And, uh, and yeah, he served less than 10 years in four decades for that. So I, you know, I felt the same thing Joe thought when I first started to piece together a timeline I really had no idea what I, what I was in for. Um, and, and Detective Mitzi Roberts and Beth Silverman all said the same thing. When they looked at this, they started to like look at his convictions and every single time he was arrested, pretty much every three days. It, I, it's hundreds of pages. They all said, how did this happen? Um, so that's a lot of people with a lot of weight behind them saying, how did this happen? Um, and I think it, to exactly Poe's point, um, you get the answer to that by taking time. And you get the answer to that by like really being respectful and able to talk to anyone and looking at people. They're people. I, I, I never quite know how to answer this question because it's not that hard for me. Um, but there, you know, there was, uh, if you got a call in South LA in the eighties about a dead prostitute in an alley, they would say there were no humans involved. Like we have a 187 on 41st and Avalon, no humans involved there's a murder, no humans involved. Um, and uh, they weren't humans to start with. It's not just in death. I mean, their education system, the healthcare system, the way that um, we serve marginalized communities. Um, this, you can uh, look at how, how did I listen to these gruesome stories? And, and um, I because somebody had to. <laughs> um, it couldn't just have been the victims who had to live through that. And, you know, you, you said something right there. How could I live through these stories? Well, can we take a moment to talk about mental health and how this series affected all of you personally and not only the families, because not only the victims, because they're still, like you said, an active victim. They're still in this conversation. but. You know, I imagine going this deep and having these conversations has its toll. So what were, if any, some of the effects of this series in your own specific space? And how were you able to cope with day after day hearing these things and knowing the injustice and knowing the inequities 
and, and, and trying to grapple with that as you're also trying to be there for this person who is talking about this and giving this narrative to you. Um, you know, I, I, let's start with you, Paul, if that's okay. I don't know. I want everybody to speak on this because I think it's really important. Um, as a woman who has, uh, of course, experienced the things that women do experience in society because there is such a, you know, incredible, you know, baked in misogyny and the kinds of violence that is acceptable against women in, in, in society, you know, it, is thank God becoming part of the conversation now. Um, but of course has sort of been accepted, as I said, um, in order to separate yourself, you can't, I mean, you're listening to it, you're experiencing it. You have to, I mean, Jillian's another story and she's the one who is really having to be deep in there, but it's, it's a room you go into and to hear him speaking about it and to talk to these people who've experienced it. Um, you know, as a mother, I, you know, I mentioned before, I feel so pained because I can put myself in the shoes of various people involved. And I come home and I see my daughter and I don't want her to know about it. But I also think we have to know about this. All of these stories, you, you know, you're, if you put your blinders on, it, it will and it is happening now. And so, you know, that's the point of what we're doing, you know, shining a light on it and trying to create you know, trigger these larger conversations that can hopefully do something to invoke change. And so, yeah, I mean, it's dark and, you know, you keep soldiering through because you're doing the job and it, 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 it seems superficially to keep a, a, a little bit of a distance between you and it because you've got these tasks at hand, but it comes back and it hits you in the face and, you know, you're supposed to have your day, your time to take care of yourself. And it's still there in the room. He's still there in the room. These crimes and this suffering is still there in the room. And, you know, it's a big, big burden that, but I feel like we have to, we have to, we have to carry it as well, because we can't leave it on those people, on the victims and their families to carry the burden of this. So, you know, it, it feels like bearing witness and doing something about it is, is it, it, you know, I feel very compelled to do that. Is that yeah. um, you know, unlike Jillian, who I'll let Jillian speak for herself, who was really having to like get into the psychology of this guy live and in real time, which, you know, I'm sure was not a great experience for her. I know it was not a great experience for her. Um, you know, I, I learned early in my career, because I've been doing this for a while, this particular subject area of crime and victims, <clears throat> you know, I've learned to compartmentalize it as best I can. Early in my career, I made a film called Paradise Lost, and uh, there was a week or so in the edit where we were still editing on film, so everything takes three times as long, where I would pour over with Bruce Sanofsky, who uh, we made that film together, and I would pour over images of um, police crime scene footage, little bit of which is in the film, hundreds of autopsy photos. I mean, I looked at things that happened to three eight-year-old boys that nobody should look at. And I remember driving home with those images in, in my brain and I had an 18 month old daughter in a crib. And I, I, I went to the crib, it's like midnight, you know, after a long day in the city editing and I picked up my child and, you know, flashed on these images and what should have been, you know, and was largely, of course, but what should have been, you know, just a precious moment of fatherhood was, you know, I felt I, I started to resent the project because I felt like some of my fatherly innocence had been stolen from me. And I had a hard time with it, you know, back then. But since then, I've learned to, um, you know, com compartmentalize it a little bit and more importantly, to use the pain of others as a motivator, you know, I'm so privileged and lucky that I can actually tell stories for a living. And I try to tell stories that shine a light on some institutional problem or some, you know, some, something that needs addressing. And so I just always keep that in mind, in, in mind. Um, and that's why when you're in this space of true crime, which I, I hate that phrase, actually true crime, 
um, because it conjures up all sorts of images of, you know, wallowing in the misery of others for entertainment purposes. And that's not what we're doing here. Um, you know, I make sure that I'm a good steward of the responsibility of telling people's story. You have to tell it responsibly. You should only take on a story uh, of somebody's victimhood if there's a message to impart that's going to help resolve a situation or shine a light on a situation. So I just, as painful as it is and as horrible as it is, I'm so thankful that I'm the teller of the story and not the subject of one of those stories. And I just try to keep it in mind, you know, and, and have it be motivating. Jillian, I, I can't even imagine what it's been like to go through this, to do this good work, but also that connection with that person who you know has done these things. Talk about the healing process as you are able to kind of navigate in this space and obviously the effect on the mental health that it's been or what toll it's taken on you. I mean, now as we're coming to the end and being able to talk about all of this and what these next episodes, and I want to get into that very soon, um, talk about how you've been able to maintain because you've been through so much already. And then to get down this dark alley again, I can only imagine. It, uh, it's a work in progress. I don't think you heal by, you know, buying the healing candle. Unless that's how you heal. Um, for me, I, I mean, I'm not sure that I heal, but I find meaning when I can tell a story about something, when I can put it on the page, bring it into a larger public dialogue, have that sort of purpose behind it. Um, and I don't know that my healing with or without Sam Little um, wouldn't be a lifelong process. Um, he's a piece of it. And it's a particularly pernicious piece to deal with a psychopath like that for that long. Um, you know, I can't really do a number on you. and. Uh, and that's part of it too. That's what I write about too. So that's that's how I do it. I I take the narrative, and it doesn't get to be Sam's anymore. Um, he yeah. had his own significant narrative too. Um, but I'm writing the book, and Joe made the movie, and I. I uh, was so thrilled when Joe approached me because I knew, you know, here's somebody who also understands that we're reaching for universal themes. And in order to m correct these biases, you have to look at them. It's, uh, you know, it's, it is horrifying to hear those stories. I mean, there's one in particular in the series that, um, was a real that it was it was just a bad one. But um and uh but so sh she should be the last one to know that. You know, I'm not such a delicate flower. Like I can hold that. So that's how I, that's how I do it. I mean <laughs> I can't tell you that Every time I think of that story, I'm not going to spring a tear. Well, not not to go into that, but to just talk about in the respect of the importance of the series and, and where you all come together to tell the story about these people who unfortunately weren't given the voice to tell it in the way that it needed to be told. So. First of all, thank you for that. Thank you for bringing this to the forefront. But talk about where we go from here. You know, we've South by Southwest offers the opportunity for us to see this stuff in advance to, to really showcase this and the importance of it. But as we continue to watch the series and as we continue to, to see the, the story unfold, talk a little bit. And Joe, I, I want you to kind of narrate this a little bit here about some of the things that we will start to see, um, you know, 
the first episodes really gave us a great look into Sam. But how much deeper do we go? Do we get into his origins about his family life? I mean, you know, I, I'm curious, how did this monster even come yeah. into this to, to fruition? But yeah. also, where is the justice? You know what I mean? Do we see more of that conversation with the prosecutor and where they dropped their ball? Because I was... I was beyond words in that moment. So there's so many things that I'm curious about, and I wonder what you can tell us without giving it all away. But yeah, I mean, it's hard. It's hard to for people who haven't seen it, and also, you know, it's hard to totally summarize it. And it's we also don't want to give away certain things. But you know, we we keep a couple of balls up in the air uh, that we follow. One is Jillian's. To me, the most exciting part of the show is that you know as Jillian gathers more and more information the tone of the uh, you know the the series starts to shift more into the present tense where Jillian is taking the clues she's unearthed uh from Sam trading notes with the FBI and Texas Rangers etc because we should say that the, you know there was law enforcement involvement now not in the day um and to me, the most exciting part of the show and the reason to do it is that Jillian's information that she gets from Sam's confessions is actually used to solve cold cases. Sadly, most of Sam's victims were Jane Doe's all around, you know, spread all over the country, uh, you know, over four decades and law enforcement and Jillian uh, do an amazing job of matching uh, confessions from Sam. Remember, this is a guy who denied, 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 and finally he starts talking, and this information is used to bring, you know, I hate to use the word closure. That's not a, you know, to anyone who's a victim of a crime, a fa you know, family member, you know, there's no closure, but there is a certain peace that you get from having an answer. And so when your loved one just disappears, or law enforcement tells you it was a natural cause and the face is smashed in, which happens in one of our stories. And it's such an obvious diss to the family to say it was, you know, natural causes. Um, so to me, the most exciting part of the show is over the course of the next few episodes, we see identifications being made and cases being solved. Um, Intercut through all that, we also go into the backstory of Sam. You get a deeper understanding. I think one of the one of the really interesting things, because of Jillian's empathy and ability to talk to this guy, you really do get some insight into into this monster. You know, it's that doesn't mean we condone him or forgive him, but you get some insight into how a monster is created. You know, from his own childhood. So I think that's valuable. Um, and uh, I th the, other, the other thread is just, you know, if, if you thought the first two episodes was shocking about prosecutorial indifference, and by the way, I want to say there's a lot of great prosecutors out there. There's a lot of great people in law enforcement, so I don't want to just paint it with a broad brush, you know. And there, were, there are some people in law enforcement in these stories who tried to do the best they could, but were crippled by an indifferent system. So it's not like we're saying all prosecutors are bad and all law enforcement people are misogynist and racist, you know, that would be ridiculous, but there is, there are inherent problems within the system. Um, and, you know, if you think you, you, you're shocked by the first two episodes worth of Sam in the hands of law enforcement and like, we got him, but no, on he went, it gets even worse over the next couple of episodes. Oh, anything I missed? <laughs> no, I, I mean, you, you said it well. I mean, the other thing that goes on in the next couple of episodes is, is, is you know, Jillian is very brave in allowing us into seeing this, the effects of this story and being this deep in. And it, it does affect her and her family. And she is, and she allows us in enough to see that you know, respectfully and show that. And so that's the other thread that you see unfolding more as the episodes go on. Um, and then I just wanted to give anecdotally what Joe was saying, you know, there were a couple of cops or a couple of people that 
really tried. I mean, to sit next to Greg Weeks in episode two, you saw it in Gainesville, Florida. That man was haunted by this case. He cried. He cried because he could not get this man and he knew. And he cried because he and they both were so devastated that, you know, the jury had a bias and they said it's about the less dead that you were mentioning. This woman, she was of a very low IQ and had, you know, her functioning in society was, was, you know, was fraught. And so she was thrown aside and they felt responsible. So absolutely, you know, there were, there was a callous indifference. There were people who caught him and let him go like, Oh yeah, that's your old lady. She's passed out in the back of the car. That happened. A cop pulled up, but there were other people who did everything they could. And, you know, there were prosecutors who didn't want to take cases. There were juries that didn't believe people. And then there were cops that didn't. And there were all the opposite was true as well. So I just wanted to add that. Um, was there anything in particular that you weren't able to highlight, get access to, things that you felt that you just kept running into roadblocks with this particular series and telling the story? Jillian, you had this amazing way of being able to get so much from Sam, but was there anything that you were like, oh, there's something deep, <laughs> he's hiding something in this space that you you wanted to unearth, but maybe didn't quite get to. I mean, you could speak on that. I'm curious about it. Um, people tend to um, ask me questions like it takes some sort of Jedi mind trick to talk to a serial killer. And I don't think that's true, but I do think you have to understand that you have to look deeper than the actual words that are coming out of their mouth to know what kind of answer you're getting. Um, so it was really when I start it, it and it took a long time. And also I did not start this in any way to solve any murders. And that's not my wheelhouse. It's, uh, you know, I was, I was going to be a witness. I was going to bring some heat to it. Um, and then hopefully get some other people interested in solving murders. Um, but I was able to sort of begin to hear what he wasn't saying. And that um, maybe told me more than what he did say. Much of the time, which is probably true about all of us, but way more true about people who have antisocial personality disorder. Um, and, uh, and so, it, yes, of course, there are a million unanswered questions. I still have a list of them. He's dead. I can't put the list away. Um, I was like, okay, file it. One less piece of paper on your kitchen table for the next time he calls. But, um, I just can't put it away. If there are unanswered questions, and also I think essentially I understand, I understand the story, um, and I and I know and hope that his dying doesn't mean that it's the end of these victims having their names restored, the ones that have been unmatched so far. And you know, kind of to wrap it all up, I I feel like this series speaks volumes to this current space that we're in where you know we have this idea or this belief that you know if you aren't someone in a, a certain percentage or if you aren't someone that uh quote unquote is is warranted this attention that perhaps your story won't be heard and so I want you to, before we go, if each of you can kind of speak on what you hope the, this, this series accomplishes, perhaps the message that goes beyond and, and how do we fix this broken system? I mean, obviously you don't have all the answers, you know, there's no special wand to make everything okay, but I feel like these conversations, series like this one, that, that is, is so important and touches on an overwhelming theme within our society is the perfect start, is a good start. But 
what do you hope that this series accomplished? And Joe, I want to start with you and then Poe and then Jillian, I want you to round it out if that's okay. Sure. Well, look, I've, I've spent a lot of time making films and TV shows about the criminal justice system. Um, a lot of it's been focused on how biased it is towards the convicted, you know, um, this doing the, this show has been a real eye opener for me, a white privileged male, uh, to really deeply understand just how women every day live with the fear of violence. And when I looked at that rap sheet and as we dug deeper into the story, the, I, the idea that, you know, a victim of a crime because they're from a marginalized community, whether it's a sex worker or somebody who has a drug problem or somebody with a mental health problem, are literally treated as, Jillian calls it, the less dead. You know, I knew it somewhere because I've seen how bad the criminal justice system is in terms of the racial inequities in sentencing and bias that leads to wrongful conviction. I've seen all that but generally with a male population. But experiencing this story and really seeing how deeply there is a bias against women and people with, you know, issues, uh, you know, just was eye-opening for me and really made me want to tell this story even more. And so, obviously, I hope we can figure out how to fix the problem. I mean, we're in a, we're in a great moment of cultural awakening. Um, you know, and I think people are more open to hearing this now. Um, and I hope people in law enforcement, you know, when they when they hear about some body being dumped uh, uh, in a back alley and it was a sex worker, that they treat it like it was, uh, you know, a Harvard University student. I mean, that's the problem is just like we make value judgments about people and just, you know, justice should be blind, you know, it's and, and equal. So that's what, I, you know, somehow, you know, we got a lot of problems, you know, in this country and a lot of problems in the criminal justice system, but treating everyone equally, both in the conviction side of things, you know, as well as in the victim side of things is just, you know, kind of what the show is all about. Yeah, absolutely. And Poe, can you elaborate, um, you're muted, um, about kind of what you hope that message is going to be and will how it you want it to resonate with those who watch. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, just to, just to support what Joe is saying, it, it, it's, a, it's like empathy and it's, it's equity in empathy. You know, people are so, when they show empathy, it's because they understand a person and she didn't deserve it. She didn't, oh, this one put themselves in harm's way. Well, why did they? And even if they, you know, what happened before that got them there and once they're there, why does that make it that this can happen to them? Like you can't, you know, you can't do that. And so that, that that's, that's one of the main things is the viewer, for viewers to be able to look at this and say, wow, there is this incredible difference between how some communities are treated than others and I might not be in that community treated that way, but that isn't okay. That's not the equality that we're, we grew up saying everybody should have in this society. Um, I had three points and I was writing them down. So I just don't want to miss them. And, um, uh, you know, so recognizing their own bias about how they view those people, recognizing the biases that's that, that are, in, you know, endemic all around uh, in the in law enforcement and in in the communities that end up being jurors, and then for these victims, like I just really feel like they deserve to be whole again, and anything we can do to 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 let them be that for their living, surviving, you know, their family members, and for them. And you know, in the end, there's this thing. Well, he's in jail, so what's the big deal of matching the crime? Well, it matters. They still need that 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 respect and even take when when it was still possible taking him to court and making him plead guilty that matters that, that there's this public reckoning that Jillian talks about and you know y y they deserve that justice you know um 
They absolutely do. And Jillian, can you round us out? I just feel that, you know, you really integrated yourself into this. Uh, you know, you, you have such an important narrative in this piece. And I want to thank you for that. I want you to thank, I want to thank you for bringing, helping to bring this to life because really this is, like I said, such an important conversation, but um, now here, what do you hope this message will be that people really take away? Um, I think there's so many things that this series really unearths and I'm just curious as to what you hope it will do. I was so excited. Um, you know, with, to have Joe and Poe around me and and to feel supported in this and um, and to their drive for social justice is so um, really inspiring and moving and and it helped me move through the process to have that behind me. Um, that said, I feel like my piece in this is you know i'm the emotional piece i'm the one who i'm the one who can listen to people and and in a way that is it, i mean it's not manufactured it's just um who i am and and there's something very um organic to me about understanding that that this is not a meritocracy i'm not the one you're ever going to hear say, you don't deserve him or he doesn't deserve you or, you know, you don't deserve this or like, we don't deserve anything. You know, we get what we get. Um, and I'm going to listen to what that's like, you know, what that was like for Paul. What's that like for Joe? What is that like for you? Um, because I'm genuinely interested. And, um, and the messaging I would, like people to get, you know, from my piece of this would be that, um, the listening part. I love that. Well, I, I want to thank you all again. Um, this has been such an amazing experience. I, I want to thank, um, South by Southwest for giving us the platform to present this. Um, I want to thank stars obviously, uh, for coming together and, and making sure that the series has, you know, the, platform to see the light of day. And uh, I think this is something that every single person who watches will be transformed. I was. So thank you for coming together. Poe, Jillian, Joe, it was a pleasure. Thank you, Candice. And thank you for your kind words and excellent leadership of this Q&A. <laughs> and thank you again to thank you again to Stars and South by Southwest. Yeah. Yeah. Thank this you. has been a real experience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.